This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest... We've got Loretta Lyon. Did That's I say it. that correct with yes. the Scottish accent? Very good. I love the Scottish accent, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> a very powerful book, Unbroken, captured in Yugoslavia, tortured, a lot of bad, nasty, dark things that people would only see, they wouldn't even seen their worst nightmares. Like you've been through so much. Motivational speaker, you're doing amazing now in life, leaving inspiration to show no matter how dark your past is you can still do something wonderful with your life. Before we get into everything, first and foremost, how are you? Oh, good. Good, thank you. How are you? Really good. <laughs> really good. I'm just down here doing my podcast for a few days, um, and then I'll go back home. But the sun is out today. I'm speaking to yourself. Life is amazing. It is. I agree. I'm going to promote <laughs> your book straight away, which is Unbroken. Where can people buy this? It's available on Amazon. And it's on Kindle or or paperback like this. And uh, I'm working on the audiobook as well because a lot of people are requesting it. So yeah. we'll see. I'm, Just... an, I'm an audiobook kind of guy. Are you? Yeah, okay, I'm lazy. I'm going to get it done. Yeah. By the end of this speech, I'm going to try and speak like you because I tend to <laughs> mimic accents without my knowledge. Yeah. Don't ask. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good thing. Before we get into everything, though, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Uh, gosh, I was born and raised uh, in former Yugoslavia. Okay. And people will learn this in the book. The book apparently is quite educational mm -hmm. from the feedback that I'm getting, which is quite, uh, quite good. I, I won't spoil the book too much, but uh, I grew up in Yugoslavia uh, with a mixed background, but I'm not going to get into that now. But my parents were are Muslims, not necessarily covered up uh, or anything like that, but fairly western looking muslim people and so where my parents decided to live was a little small town majority if not all were muslims and albanian speaking so in that town majority was albanian speaking but then the next town was a mix it's where i went to school mm -hmm. so at school we learned two languages these were the two languages spoken at all times, Albanian and uh, the first one was Serbian and then Albanian as a second language. And uh, yeah, side by side, we spoke both languages and we lived amongst each other with the Albanian speaking and the Serbian speaking nationalities. I think when I look back and even now, because people sometimes say, oh, you must really you know, how do you feel about back home? You must hate it. I'm like, no, I don't, because hate is such a big word. I don't hate anything about my people or anything about these nationalities that gave me all these troubles in this book, as as it says. But uh, I, I absolutely love my people because they are very straightforward. I just realized that evil exists in any nation, any religion, and especially at war. And so going back to my childhood, I had such a humble childhood. I grew up, we grew up very poor, but 
to me, I think there is poor in wealth in terms of money and then it's also poor in love or respect or peace. And we had that as richness. You know, we had a lot of respect in the house. I had a great family. I'm the only child. And so for me, wealth, number one, meant that respect, the love, that's really important because the rest can come. And so my dad worked really hard as a doctor to to provide for us. He's a doctor. He was a doctor. I should say, I keep speaking present tense, but he was a doctor. And my mom, professor of languages. And so they really tried their best to give me the best life they could. <laughs> yeah, very it's well nice. educated, very good parents who tried their best. What, what were you like at school? Myself? Yeah. Brilliant. I just really good wanted to... shoes? I, I was just one of these students that everybody thought I was an example because I was well behaved, never really caused any scenes, always liked peace. I always tried to, you know, diffuse any conflict in the class, in the classroom, assistant to some of the professors eventually as I went to the high school because I became very good at technical engineering. And um, I wanted to be a doctor actually, like my dad, but that didn't work out. And uh, didn't work out because of the war. But in the meantime, I was studying technical engineering. I did. I had really high all my all my all my grades. Sorry, I'm mumbling. Were all high, the highest you could get. Is that because because I've interviewed many Muslim brothers and sisters where they talk about how strict the household was with the Muslim beliefs? Like I'm not a religious man anymore, mm. but I'm, I keep saying this, but I'm probably more sway to. The Muslim kind of culture, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't gamble, I don't take drugs, I don't eat bacon. But it's just, I like that sort of belief. Do you feel, because with the strict household, it, I feel as if a lot of families now are becoming weaker. They're coming from broken homes. There's a lot of uncertainty, unease, and parents struggling and abandonment issues for kids, and it tend to go down the route of addiction. But do you, did you see, was it a strict household where get your grades, make something of your life because your dad and mum led by example? Was there a lot of pressure on you from them because they were doing it and they understood the key elements to be successful? To my surprise, my parents never forced me to do anything. In fact, I think compared to the parents now, and I look back, they were the most holistic parents anyone could wish for. They never imposed religion on me or never put me under pressure to study. I was just genuinely really driven. I wanted to do well at school. And some may argue, say, oh, school is not all that important. And, and that's fine. You know, I'm never going to argue with people because everybody's entitled to their opinions. But I think I did it because I, I always was so, I craved to learn and explore. I was so passionate about space. So I think finding out things that we didn't have internet so books were the only things teachers were the only people you could ask questions you know now you go on google and you say google tell me this and they tells you <laughs> alexa yeah. uh, you know yeah, you get I, all the answers yeah. you know and uh, these generations looking at children now they have the answers on on their you know the fingertips where we didn't so school was really something for me anyway it was something I don't know, I just saw so much wealth in learning and I wanted to do well. I wanted to become a doctor. I genuinely saw a lot of value in doing so, but my parents never pushed me. In fact, sometimes they used to ask me to chill because I would stress out so much. I'm very OCD. Like I have to do things straight away. If a task is given to me, I have to complete it. I have to deliver and then over deliver. So I've always been like that as a child picking things up quickly. I mean, languages come very easily to me, so I, I tend to pick up languages very quickly. And I couldn't speak English when I came to the UK 22 years ago, 23. So it comes to show you that, you know, it's just it's just the way I was, you know, I was created to want to learn and to, I don't know, to, to do something. But yeah, so never, uh, in terms of religion, my parents only towards the, as they got an older, have they turned after they retired and everything, they turned more to praying and practicing five times a day because prior to that, uh, they and I, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I noticed it was really hard to stay on top of it because uh, my mom was teaching throughout the day in the school. So doing five times a day of praying, she found it difficult to keep up with. She, she would do maybe an early prayer, 
evening prayers and then anything in between or at the weekend. Whereas my dad, being a doctor and all, he then would be called on emergencies and his duties. So he really also struggled to stay on top of it. But they did their best. They, did, they fasted mm -hmm. and all. Never once did they ever say, you must do this, must do that. In fact, in, book, in, in my book, I mentioned going to my dad and saying, oh, dad, all my you know, my cousins and the neighbors' children are going to the mosques to learn Quran, the, the, our Bible. And I said, I want to go and learn Arabic. And this is because I have such passion for languages. And my dad looked at me and said, listen, if, if that's what you want to do, you do it. But I'm not asking you to go do or anything. Because he meant, what he meant is when you go to mosque, you have to cover up. So unlike in the Middle East, when people cover up, they cover up and they don't take it off. Back home, people, especially children, they would only cover to go to mosque and then take the scarf off or, or anything that covered them up. So it was a bit of a, um, just a slightly different kind of way of uh, religion. It's not really, it's not like, um, in, uh, I think in every country or society, it's, it's treated differently slightly. So some more extreme than others. So yeah, I did I did study Quran and I loved it, being able to write in Arabic and, and read in Arabic, although I didn't understand a word. <laughs> it was just read and write. It's a bit like talking to me then, and it's a bit like listening to me, the Scottish no, accent. I love it, honestly. I think I I'm such a big fan of Scotland. And when I watched Braveheart, the movie, the Mel Gibson's movie, yeah. oh my God, I cried so much. And at that point when I watched it, nobody knew my story. And the guy that I was with didn't understand why I cried so much. But everything like that, injustice, um, cruelty, just brings me, really brings me to my knees. I'm very sensitive when it comes to even the power of the word, because people think the power of the word, it just, it's, there is no power. You can say smiling and you can say a really nasty word and it will affect somebody for days and you have no idea you had that effect on them and in a bad way as well. So I always try to really think before I put something out there because I know it's all, it's like a real spell. You don't know how you're going to affect someone. Yeah, words are so powerful and I've been saying this actually recently. They used to say sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt me but I believe names are probably worse because yeah. names and what people say break people. They break them down, it manipulates them, it kills their soul, it kills their spirit. And the sad thing is people take their life by what people say about them. Even on on social media, just certain sentences, certain words towards someone, they can't handle it anymore and they take their life. So words are powerful. And like you say, it's spelling, writing things down, it's spelling, it's putting things into the universe. You are what you speak. You are what you eat, you are what you visualise and we're just living in a society where everything seems uneasy. There's an unrest. Mm. I love Scotland because it's nature, it's green. I used to love London but there's just a, a little unrest down here when I'm here now. I, just, I don't know what that is, just a little feeling. Mm. Um, I love the people but I've got friends from all over but it's just a little weird vibe. I don't know what it is. Um, hopefully it, it goes but it's just the way I feel sometimes. So was your life going amazing then? Studying, good girl, mum and dad doing well, praying, you were learning languages, you were very interested in very much books and just being a good girl and trying to make something in your life. Was life perfect? Was there any unrest in Yugoslavia then where you talk about other countries and the wars? Was that like Ireland? Mm. When you've got Northern Ireland and stuff, there was a lot of bad stuff there just a few years ago, a lot of killings. I go to Belfast for some interviews and again there's a little feeling of uneasy. I don't, maybe that's just because of the shit that they went through and there's still that energy there, but was there ever any signs of wars coming or anything arising back then? I remember it as a child actually. I, I mean, I remember as I was growing up, my mum kept saying to my dad, since Tito, a leader at that time in Yugoslavia, yeah. I don't know who will remember here listening, Tito, since he died, she kept saying to my dad, it just doesn't feel right anymore. And I didn't, I think when Tito died, I was born kind of, these people are going to work out now my age, 
25. <laughs> <laughs> Same age as me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, and I used to think, what does this mean? Tito died. Who was, I mean, we knew Tito, everybody. He was very well regarded. In fact, I spoke about him recently on holiday. I just, I was reflecting back on how well regarded he was. He, he kept our country at bay and he was well respected in Europe and, you know, the United Nations and all of this. And then, um, this episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. It was all for the power of a seed, for po politics, basically. So the civilians really were never for war. But from my perspective, this is only from my, what I've seen, what I've witnessed. It came down to power, land, uh, control, and ultimately religion, and then ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing became such a big thing. So when you look back at Yugoslavia, it was Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, uh, Montenegro, Kosovo. Macedonia, uh, Kosovo. Am I missing anything? I don't think so. What about Czech Republic and stuff? No, is, they were not. Is that not near one near? They are near with us on the border, but they're not. They were never part of us. And maybe in a very, very long time ago, there was this, some kind of a union going on, but not that I remember in history. But uh, this was Yugoslavia. And so they started the war with Croatia initially, I believe, the Serbs. So there was a, a big conflict there. Somehow Croatia and then got Bosnia got hit, and this is all in the north. And Bosnia was hit the most, and they did the biggest massacre because UN couldn't make it in time. The troops were not uh, authorized to go on time to save the people. So they, they it was one of the biggest graveyards ever found of ethnic cleansing and only because they were Bosnian uh, Serbian speaking with different dialects like you have a different dialect to the British and so just because of their religion because they were Muslims so that was ethnic cleansing because they were mu well mostly because they were Muslims so is that what that means ethnic cleansing ethnic is really should just mean for example, in Kosovo, they did a lot of ethnic cleansing, and that's what they tried to do to our town. Killing people. Because they speak a religion. different language. But then it turned into religion, so ethnic cleansing. So they didn't want the Albanian speaking communities anymore. And also anyone that was Muslim that would practice the religion. So although it was called ethnic cleansing, most people thought that even religious cleansing was all one because it unfortunately just how we unfolded. But uh, yeah, our town was singled out for ethnic cleansing and we were all Muslims and Albanian speaking because my parents decided to live in that town because they found jobs, which is fine. And because um, my mom's origin is from Turkey, she's a mix. Uh, uh, she's from Bursa originally, but she studied in, in former Yugoslavia. She met my dad and, you know, she's just happy, happy go lucky. But uh, going back to the book or to my story, when we got singled out for ethnic cleansing, it was uh, really stressful. By then, we had already figured out that Kosovo just went through a huge war with Serbia and United Nations had interfered. And when United Nations interfered in Kosovo, what happened was Serbia dialed the heat in its own land by attacking the towns that are Albanian-speaking which also happens to be Muslim, because there is some Albanian speaking, but they are Catholics, but mostly in, in Kosovo and Montenegro, you find these, these communities. And also, my bet, it's also Macedonia, but not so much where we were. And so, yeah, they, Milosevic, I can even say that, he was in charge of all of this and he dialed up the heat and we were singled out for ethnic cleansing. And uh, my, I'm not, again, I don't want to spoil the book too much, but we were saved. My uncle was really wealthy guy. He was a farmer and uh, he used to say to my dad, brother, you've gone and, you know, wasted all these years in university. And as a doctor, you can hardly make your ends meet, you know, because the doctors didn't really earn much in uh, former Yugoslavia. But uh, he said, look at me. I'm just, 
you know, I'm just a farmer. And he used to joke. He was such a joker. And he was right. It just, then I, he inspired me because I thought, you know what? I'm so fixed in like education and stuff. But ultimately, if you have a drive and you want to have a better life or you've got great ideas, you've got good business sense, you can apply that. You don't need a diploma. Yeah. So I think going back to that kind of in this day and life without we don't have any war. I think you don't necessarily always need the qualification. No, everybody defines success differently. Some yeah. people might define it by going to law school and being a doctor for four years, six years, nine years, whatever it takes to get degrees and diplomas. But uh, the most successful people I know are the ones who didn't go to university. There's a lot of people I know who go to university and don't actually do anything with their degree. Yeah. So again, it's just life. It's only textbooks. You're only studying and memorizing whatever's on those textbooks. Yeah. Not really life. We need doctors, of course. We need lawyers. But for me, life is life. I'm trying to go through it blissfully and peacefully as I can. Sometimes I'm living in chaos, but that's okay. That's life. We're living yeah. in a very fast-paced world. But I think it's important for people to understand because not everybody loves education. I fucking hated it. I just like to stare out the window and look for spaceships. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I'm I was waiting kind of, for them to come. Uh, yeah, that, well, apparently it's coming soon, so we'll see. But I just, I was a visionary. I like to, I, I wasn't very good academically, but sports and stuff and outdoors, I, I thrived. I loved that. And what does yeah. the saying Einstein says? If you judge a fish by climbing a tree, the, the fish will believe it's stupid or something. But I feel as if, <laughs> everybody's different we've all got different beliefs we've all got different the way we see the world so when your uncle came he so he saved you the farmer the funny man he saved the whole town literally he How so? i mean um it's a real scene it's a very intense scene we get uh, dragged out of the houses and it's a huge chaos what age uh, were you then i i was 17 just about have just hit 17 and uh, for the for the listeners, we are about to touch base on human trafficking. And if people haven't gathered the story yet, but it started with ethnic cleansing and then war brought human trafficking and organ harvesting as a market. So this is where we had him with the story, just so they are aware. And so, yeah, so we got marched into the crease of the mountain it was really late at night. It was cold, it's children screaming, babies screaming, the elderly limping. We're being pushed around. It was really daunting and scary. It was this really uneasy kind of background noise of a footsteps of the soldiers just marching us and people just shuffling because it was the whole entire town. And it's a big town. And so when we go to the crease of the mountain, and uh, it's dark and it's cold and we could just about see the sky. Uh, the soldiers are screaming, oh, we, we got them all here, all in Serbian. And we all understand the language because we, both, we all learn both languages at school. So majority of the people in that crowd speak both languages. And they say, we got them now. We're going to do the biggest massacre that's ever been. We're going to show you United Nations that they should never get involved with Kosovo. They should let us lead our war with them. So they all for the sake of making a point. And my uncle is standing there and he just said to my dad, just watch them. I'm going to speak to them. And my dad is like, don't even. They're going to kill you on the spot. We were dying anyway. And so uh, he negotiated with them. He said, you're going to be hunted forever. If you don't take my deal, I'm going to give you wealth that you can only dream of. Take the wealth, spare the town, and you don't even need to work for these people, meaning you don't have to even serve in the army. Just disappear. The, the rest of the... Um, People that were in power, they could easily disappear to other countries. But the civilians that were at war, all the all the borders were shut. So when you look at Ukraine now, at least, although I work with the survivors of Ukraine and we work with charities with Ukraine, they can come out of the country, the least to say. We couldn't. For us, it was like on the frying pan. That was it. So we all knew either way we're going to die. But how are we going to die? We, we were just waiting for it. And um, after a long negotiation that my uncle did, eventually they said, okay, let's, uh, let's see how much wealth he has. He's bluffing. And uh, my uncle said, I'm going. My mom followed my uncle. She's like, I'm coming. I'm like, mom, like, could you just please? I was like, I'm laughing now, but I remember the fear. I'm, I, like, I'm like, oh my God, I'll never see my mom again. 
and uh, she went and helped my uncle. But yeah, that really um, that really saved us that night. I never knew my my uncle was that wealthy. He had when we after we got released because uh, you, you can imagine after quite some time they went digging in my uncle's garden they found all the gold everything that my uncle had hidden everything that he's ever earned they took all the wealth and the soldiers just kept retreating themselves and then we, we were just left there unaware they said stay here don't move and we didn't move for like hours and then my dad said we need to make a move because they're not here anymore some people were saying well that might be snipers we said, we've got to move. We can't stay in the mountain. It was cold. Children were crying. Babies hungry. So we decided to take the risk and we walked back into our sort of into the town again and to our homes. And I found my mom and my uncle just sitting there. They thought they had killed us anyway because we, we took us ages to get back home. So my uncle and my mom thought if they hadn't come yet, it's been a while since we gave the gold. They spare us to see the trouble, to see the defeat. So they've killed the town. But when they heard us coming in, it was a very emotional time. I just never forget, you know, going into my uncle's garden and just seeing them. It was like, yes, <laughs> it's nice. That's a ballsy move. But like you say, you were dead anyway. So to take yeah. that risk and for your uncle to do that, I'm surprised they didn't kill you anyway. Honestly, I, I, I genuinely, I, I'm really surprised that they didn't. I don't, nobody understands to this day, everybody that remembers that night, and it's so many young generations now, they were babies then, they don't remember it, but I do, and there's so many other people. We often talk about my uncle and how he's become this legend. He he's must have had a bit of Scottish in his blood, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, Funny, that's brave. Oh, he Reminds was... me of myself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yourself and Mel Gibson. <laughs> did, how many people did they save? Save everyone. So the whole town got saved. But the the trouble started the next day when um, basically what happened was in the next couple of days after that, uh, the soldiers kept attacking the, the town, raping women and really like properly going at it. And my dad um, just came home and he's like, listen, I need you to pack. I'm like, what? what? I'm not going anywhere. I was like, what the heck? He's like, no, 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 you, are, you have to go across the mountain, go into Kosovo and all the borders were shut. So he meant I had to trek through the mountain on my own. Okay, it's not very far, but it's a few miles that I don't know directions. I mean, you, when you're in the mountains, you get completely lost because you can't see sense of direction. And I was young and it was cold. And um, anyway, after a long debate, my mom said, you got to listen to your dad. I said, well, you come with me. She's like, I can't leave your dad. So I decided to listen to my dad and we said goodbye. I crossed the mountain into Kosovo just to, to give the overview of the story found a bus and I speak the language in Kosovo they speak Albanian only and because uh, the Serbian because there were Serbs as well in, in Kosovo but they had left by that point they were migrating into Serbia and I went in got on the bus managed to get into the to the capital of Kosovo which is now Pristina it will always be Pristina anyway and um by that point, the night had fallen and I, I was thinking, where do I go? Where is the Red Cross? Because my dad really said, you need to go and find the Red Cross. I'm like, okay, the Red Cross, cool. The camps, I got it. And I got completely lost. Didn't know what I was doing. I was thirsty. I was hungry and ended up, I saw this bar open and it was police hours as well. So nobody on the roads and it's quite daunting. And I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? I don't know. This town is big. And um, I went into this bar. When I walked in, I was so surprised. Everybody there was foreign foreign police officers. They all had blue helmets, a uh, uniform I'd never seen before, some blue, some <clears throat> with flags, with different flags, German flags. And I walked in and I was like, oh, my God, I walked into some different country, not even, this is not Kosovo. So I went to the bar and spoke to them in Albanian. I said, I just need a glass of water because they looked at me too young to be in a pub. Uh, well, <laughs> they looked at me a bit sheepish. They're like, what are you doing here? So I got some water and then um, basically decided to go outside and um, sit because I didn't know where to go. 
But I was very lucky. So I went outside, sat down, and I started to cry because I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And I didn't tell the barman that I'm looking for the Red Cross. I just, I completely shut down. I didn't know what to do. What I witnessed back home, I was really worried to tell anyone I was from Serbia. And to my surprise, I was followed out. So as I sat down, I looked up and there was two big American guys. I'm not even going to try to do the accent. They are my best friends still. I love them to bits. And um, Peter and Brian, they both looked at me with a translator, hands like this on their waist, like in English, because I didn't understand English. What are you doing here? It's dangerous. And I'm looking at them like, what? Although I was good at languages, I wasn't confident enough to speak English because we didn't learn it at school, only through movies. Uh, we weren't very lucky to learn it properly at school. And uh, the Albanian guy said, it's dangerous on the road. What are you doing here? They're asking you. I said, I am looking for the Red Cross. I'm from Serbia. And immediately I saw the translator's face just change as if to say, oh, I'm from Serbia. What are you doing here? You are not welcome here. But luckily he did translate it to them. And they said, we can't take her to Red Cross now. But since she's completely on her own and lost, can, we can give her shelter in our own apartment and it was so out of, you know, out of ordinary, so to say. I was like, what? Two men? Their apartment is like, no way am I going with these two people. Like, you know, young girl, Muslim girl, and thinking these big guys. Anyway, uh, I didn't have a choice, to be honest. And I said to the translator, okay, I'll go. And will they then take me to the Red Cross tomorrow? He said, well, we'll speak tomorrow about it. Go in the Jeep. Uh, it was a big Jeep took me to their apartment. They were so respectful. My goodness, I was so lucky, so lucky to have stumbled across them. And uh, they took me straight to the kitchen. There was a sofa there, gave me blankets, pillow, some pajamas, Brian's pajamas, big, massive. Peter got me these little like slip-ons with ducks on them. I'd never seen anything like that with the shape of the duck. And it was also alien to me because I grew up so poor. Uh, what well, pyjamas, I want pyjamas for all my life kind of thing. We we were very poor. And um, so they all dressed, you know, they gave me stuff. I got myself dressed. I was so cold, made me some tea. And the translator stayed for a bit. We couldn't really communicate in English. Just they were trying to speak in Albanian, the police officers, peacekeepers. And well, we were trying our best. But that morning when we woke up, they had to go to work. So they said to the translator, just tell her to stay here. She can't leave the apartment. She can't leave without us at all. When we come back, we're going to speak to our superior and see what should we do about her going to the Red Cross. I didn't understand until much later why they wouldn't send me to the Red Cross. And they never explained this to me because of the translator. They never trusted the translator and they were in the, in the right t sort of right feeling, right um, kind of instinct not to have trusted him because he was the one that got me in trouble completely. And um, and they came back and in that time that they went to work in that same day, I thought this whole place looked a mess. <laughs> and I started cleaning the uniforms, hanging, brought this carpet in from outside. It was wet and I had to dry it. And it was. And they came home and I was cooking some food and they were like, what on earth is going on, this girl? <laughs> like, a, I just wanted to thank them. I wanted to say thank you for having me, you know, in the night. Because I was in, in the streets, I was scared. So I didn't know how to thank them. So I made it homely for them. I even cooked a meal. <laughs> and they started laughing. They sat the translator down and they said, just tell her that she cannot be sent to the Red Cross. But until things calm down in Serbia and we will keep an eye from over here, what's happening in her town... She has to stay here. Is she all right with that? I had no choice. I had to be all right with it. And then we became the best friends. It was really just the most unexpected friendship and respect they showed me. And they not even from my religion or my nationality or anything. But I'm so pleased I met them because any time, at any point in the future from then on, somebody completely broke my faith in men, my my trust in my own people or my own religion. It was those two guys that constantly 
reminded me that they, in order to have that respect and trust, people didn't have to be from the same religion or the same culture. It was a universal thing. So you have bad and good in every culture and you have bad and good in every religion. But yeah, they, they were great. But then the translator had given me up to the human trafficking gang, one of the biggest human trafficking gang to this day, believe it or not. They're still alive. They're still very dangerous. And they're still ticking. Human trafficking is at the all-time high. It's more money made than human trafficking now than drugs. That's how big yeah. a business it is with the, the organs and... Organ harvesting, yeah. The harvest harvesting is unbelievable for the things that they're doing to create money and generate money from kids, adults. Yep. It's all around the world and it's a massive, massive business. I had a man on who was a Royal uh, Navy SEAL from America and he tries to, he goes to places in Asia and tries yeah. to stop it, but it's just, it's just so big and there's just so much money involved. It's scary to think that shit happens in the world. So see when you get captured, what happens then? I got taken, it was this one day, I never left the apartment on my own because I knew I wasn't supposed to. But we didn't have electricity because it was still sort of war, in, even in Kosovo. So I thought there was always a stand just outside of the window and I could see it from Peter's bedroom. And I thought, you know what, if I could just go and, and just get a magazine so I can read, because I was going a little bit crazy. You know, you, you, you're there on your own all day. They at work. They can't take you with you. Although they did a lot with me. They took me that I met majority of their f friends in, in the military and stuff. They introduced me. I was not somebody they kept hidden. So the, all their... Um, hierarchy they knew I was there and they wanted me safe and the reason they wanted me safe because uh, again I had cross borders from Serbia to Kosovo so I was a huge target and they wanted me to be safe until they were ready to send me back to Serbia and so um, I thought do you know what I'm going to go buy a magazine I had some spare change and I said you know what if I just buy a magazine it's only 50 pence I mean I can read something all the housework were done and I didn't have anything on me. I even left the door uh, semi-open because I didn't intend to take the keys and leave completely. It was open and I just left something to block the door. I went out and I just heard this squeaking wheels like a really harsh black van pulls in front of me on top of the pavement. And uh, my my instant reaction was to say, excuse me, watch out. What are you doing on payment? So I'm about to tell them off. Little did I know they're going to actually, they're going to be the ones telling me off and, and completely terrorize my innocent mind. So they they came out so quickly. They opened the doors. And I was like, like whoa, I, I didn't even know what happened. It was so fast. They put this black thing over my head and they both of them, two guys, they grabbed me just up here and sort of shoved me into the van, closed the door and was like, let's go, let's go, all in Albanian, they're speaking Albanian. I'm like, this is surely a like a, a nightmare drone. I'm having. Like I was hoping I'm having a nightmare and I can, you know, like a dream, I can pinch myself mm -hmm. and I could wake up. And they were like, we got her, we got her. And they're calling me names and they're referring to me really nasty words. And I was like, wow, this is happening and this is, I'm like, what's going on? Why am I the spy? They were calling me a spy. Ended up uh, dragging, uh, we did drive very far. It's still in the central of um, Pristina at this abandoned building. And they end up dragging me from the van to, to this room, a huge building. And when we got near, my feet were dragged. I, I, was, I wasn't even walking. My toes were just like, I could feel the ground. I was just being dragged like a body. And they're still swearing and they're so happy they have got me away from the Americans. And they said, we found, I mean, they're swearing. They, we found her and this and that, the spy, this and that. And I'm like, oh my God. I, I, I really started panicking. I knew I was in big trouble. And uh, the boss said take the hoodie off so they took the hoodie off and I was on my knees and I looked at him he looked at me said oh so he said you're the one and I'm thinking 
okay, clearly I'm so famous now. I mean, I'm the one. <laughs> wow. Such a spy. James Bond girl. <laughs> you know, when I look back, I'm like, gosh, bad, bad girl. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> um, he actually gave the, the, the order for me to be, what can I say in this podcast? Can I use words? Anything you want. Yeah. So he said, okay, I want to watch this. You guys rape her. And when he said that, I was like, oh, my God. And I, you know, you can't even describe it with words. The, the millions of conversations in my head with myself, like this can't be happening. This is not happening. And I started screaming because I was flipped on my back. I'm pinned down by other guys. And all my everything I had on was ripped so fast. And the only thing I could do is just as I was pointing my, my face to the ceiling and I'm just like, please don't do this. I'm a virgin because I didn't know what else to say. I was so scared. I mean, the way I was, I grew up is that in a small town, in order to marry a, a nice, decent guy, you had to be a virgin when you marry or when you decide to be somebody's. Otherwise, the whole town will know they will, they will let you go. You can't stay in a family if you haven't come as a virgin. Things have changed now. It's tremendously, I'm so surprised. When I go back home, it's like like anywhere else in the world. But not so long ago, it wasn't the same. This is only 20-something, 20 23 years ago, 24 years ago, maybe. We're talking really like extreme in terms of you had to be a virgin, that kind of stuff. When they heard, when the boss heard this, because the guys were so charged up, like, yeah, we're going to do this. And the boss luckily heard when I, when I said that so out loud that I was a virgin. And he's like, whoa, boy, stop. And they all stopped. It's like they programmed to stop. And they're all like undressing. And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God. I'm like, oh, my God. It's just like, what's happening? He's like, put something on her. He said, boys, we have stumbled across a huge cargo. In my humble opinion, cargo is something that you ship and you, it's good. And I thought, what cargo? I'm a human. Like I'm thinking in my head. I, mean, I was always like a thinker. He said, right, let's get her ready to the safe house because uh, she needs a lot of training. And I, I didn't understand what he was meaning with a lot of training. So it took me to the house and introduced me. They had, there was a lady there, this woman, uh, much older than me. And uh, she was very sinister. And uh, they all were sinister, to be honest. Very, very, very rough people. And... Uh, they trained me. They, I mean, in the book, it's a lot of details. I don't want to even go into the details now. It's quite upsetting. But I was um, just on the hindsight, I was made to watch a lot of the act and to the point where, you know, it's like people might watch porn and they might enjoy it. But when you are forced as a child to watch something like that and a gun being held to your head that you have to watch, you can't even blink no matter what's happening, how cruel the sexual act is, and whether the person that's being done to is conscious or not, you're still having to watch. And it's um, if you see an animal like that, it's upsetting. When you see a human, it's lifeless. And uh, being abused like that, it's, it's, uh, it's hard. Yeah, that's heartbreaking. Like that's you, you wouldn't wish that upon anyone. But how many people were in this place? Do you know? It was. I never. I only saw the other girls when they came to be done something to. Who was I, doing something to them? Was it the soldiers gang. or was it the gangs? Uh, the gang, the human trafficking gang. I was taken by human trafficking gang and organ harvesting gang. So I was with them now. There were no soldiers. They were just complete monsters. And no matter what they claimed they were in the past or who they served, I can tell you they might have served for the sake of anger or vicious stuff, and they might have killed some Serbs in the act of war. But what they continued to do to their own people, because I, I was from outside, but they continued to do this to their own people. The Kosovan children that went missing, the Kosovo girls that went missing during the war some of which organs have been found to exist in someone else's body in Germany and so on. I've been following such a track of people asking questions, where did my heart come from? When they start doing the research and the DNA, they go back to Kosovo. But my son has gone missing since war. We thought he was dead. 
now your son clearly was trafficked and his heart taken by the black market and ended up saving a boy in Germany, that kind of stuff. So how could you do this to your nation? And so when I say this, I don't hate the Kosovo. I absolutely love the people are so lovely. And I have lots of Kosovo friends and I have so many Serbian friends. But I'm saying that the gangs, the, the, the human trafficking, regardless of what nationality or religion they are from, they are monsters. If they are even able to think of trafficking anyone or doing anything to anyone that's living being, for me, they are monsters. I don't care what religion they are. To me, they have zero religion. Or For me, they're just like, uh, how can I say, no identity. They're just monsters. Yeah, evil. That's evil, evil complete world. evil. You are doing the most catastrophic things for money. Yeah. That's what it all boils down That's to, it. money. They completely brainwash. They all they care. It's money. The suffering and the pain. I don't believe in wars. I don't believe there should be wars, but I understand people can be brainwashed. I interviewed a man earlier who says, look, at that time I was conditioned to just follow orders. Yeah. Just do what I want. I thought that was normal. Some people came out of the army and they think, what was I doing? You talk about the weapons of mass destruction that didn't even exist. There was over a million people were killed. Who are they fighting for? It's for the greed of the hierarchies who are calling the shots to make yep. them richer but yet those suffer. Homeless people on the streets, the majority of homeless are military. They go away and fight for a country that when they come home, no one fights for them. And this is a sad reality of it. I don't believe in wars. I feel as if all wars are murder. Some people might get upset with that, but that's just the way I see the world. There was a time I actually tried to join the Marines, but I'm glad I didn't get into it because I would have been so, I'll do whatever it takes. This is the right thing to do. That's what I believe was, was just, when interviews so many people, you realise the destruction, the pain, the misery it causes and, innocent kids and women and men men come back with PTSD because it's not a humane thing human beings shouldn't be seen destruction, pain, torture, misery the PTSD now is a big thing where people are struggling mentally, why? because it's not a thing you should be seeing, human beings should be the cheese is, is the most important thing on this planet is love Yeah. but it's difficult because sometimes we don't love ourselves sometimes we hate others and the whole vengeance and anger and that's just the environment we're in, it's so fast paced we don't really sit back and meditate and go well, wait a minute life is pure life is beautiful and we're all confused yeah. including myself listen i have the answers to how i should be feeling i don't always follow it because i'm trying to improve i'm trying to create a business i'm trying to earn money even though i know money's bullshit it's an energy currency it's an illusion it doesn't really mean anything but we give it so much meaning here we feel as if that's what we need instead of communication helping others because the gift in life is helping others as soon as you help someone you automatically feel good. It's a one-one yeah. for both parties. How long were you in captivity for? I was with them for quite some weeks. Uh, and I really had to, in the book, it's everything is precise because I contacted my two American police officers and got the timeline right. Because what you find is I also suffer with PTSD. I, I suffered so much after that. I was on a suicidal watch initially in the UK because I was, what happened next after my kidnap it just gets worse and worse. And you just think when you just like this can't go any worse than this, then you end up even worse. So when I eventually made it here, the PTSD was huge. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I went blank. I almost tried to delete you know, it took me quite a while to retrieve all my memories because I was trying to block it so much because I really, it's, it's a, I, I did this um, live thing the other night on Instagram only because I wanted to be really vulnerable with people, for people, for my audience that asked me, you are so strong. I'm not always strong. I'm, I'm only strong because I'm trying to do the right thing. It, that's giving me strength. But when I go to bed every night, I have, I go through the same journey that I've been through in real life every night. Every night I face these people. So it never goes away. I can completely understand the soldiers. I have lots of soldiers that I know and they... They've done their best. And I know sometimes maybe they've done, you know, when the, because I've spoken to them, I've been working with them. It was out of their control because sometimes you get 
get like you get the orders and people making the orders are not there. They're not seeing everything. It's only through statistics or information. So it's really hard sometimes to make these decisions. Even Peter and Brian, I mean, after what happened to me, Peter, especially Brian, Peter came to the UK and saw me. We reunited, but Brian completely hibernated. He was really hurt. And I always asked Moni to know, you know, how did he feel? You know, how, what was going through his mind? after he knew that I was gone. They thought I was just gone. I left them. I ran away. But when I initially escaped my kidnapping, my first kidnapping, first I say, because there is the second coming, uh, I had an interview at the police station in Kosovo and uh, they wanted to know what had happened because the moment I got rescued or ran away, I was fighting with the last guard that was left to kill me, rape me and kill me. It's a long story and people can, you know, read the book. It's it's really detailed. So that night that I fought against the driver, the the driver, the uh, guard, uh, as I I went down, I mean, I, I tricked him and so on, but as I walked down the stairs, it was from the fourth floor. When I come out, it was after midnight, and he punched me so hard. He had a gun on him and he punched me so hard. I went flying onto the road. And as I flew onto this middle of the road in Kosovo, in Pristina, I looked around because I was all disorientated and I could see a big Jeep, sim- same as the police American officer's Jeep that they gave me shelter, Peter and Brian. And I thought, oh, this is a police officer Jeep. So I started screaming and it was dark, only the street lights a little bit. And... Um, the police officer that was finishing his duty was an Italian police officer. And the reason I remember is because I saw his flag. So he saw me. So he started shooting at my guy that is about to shoot me. And he then started shooting at the police officer. So there was a lot of shooting going on while I was crawling on the road towards the police officer to hide behind the car. And uh, go to the police station. We do the interview. And they really are grateful that I finally, and they said, do you believe that you are the only survivor? We've been, we've been waiting for someone like you to come along. And you have to appear in court. I said, there is no way I want anything to do with this. I said, here's the interview. I had a case number. I said, I want to go. I wanted to come back to Serbia and, and die at war with my mom and dad. I didn't want to be near these people. So uh, they took me back to Brian and Peter. I told them that they were giving me shelter. They woke up, they woke them up at 3 a.m. in the morning by then. Peter took me in. Brian woke up completely depressed. And they learned what had happened to me. The next day they said, Loretta, you have to go because now it's really dangerous. We have to change apartment. But you also need, you need to make a move. <coughs> Excuse me to Serbia because now you are complete target like they were probably would have followed me everywhere until they killed me and that was going to put their mission at risk themselves and every every, everyone involved so it was the right choice to have made went back to Serbia they put me on this bus that took me as near to the border as possible crossed the border again I knew where to start to cross the border still illegally because the, the borders were still shut and when I reached my town, it was like a ghost town that had been bombing, that had been like you could see the smoke and the, the, the air wasn't clear. And it was like a ghost town, literally like, oh, it's like, um, I don't know how to explain. And I got these shivers on me and I thought, oh, this, this is not safe and probably they're all dead, but I'm just going to go and see. By that point, what had happened is our town had gone to war against the soldiers. So where the border with the town is, they had um, created these barricades, so they were shooting each other. But where I entered, there was nobody. But it was mostly on the on the main kind of road where the big trucks would come in and the tanks. 
I went into my mum's and dad's garden and I can't find them anywhere in the house. And I thought, they died. They must have died in the crease of the mountains. I'm thinking these thoughts. Was there never any, any word contacted with your mum and dad when you were with the Americans? No, it's no way. Cause every, so you're all still the lines, living every day not knowing yeah, what's not happening knowing, back home? No news, not knowing, no contacts, uh, no telephone, nothing. It no was way, all, it was all dead. It was like... A non-existent kind of place. Mm -hmm. It's quite uh, daunting not to yeah. know because I wondered all the time if they're still alive. Yeah, because that's added pressure without all the other shit added yeah. on to what you were going through. To be honest, when I got taken the first time by the human trafficking and I knew because they told me like, uh, we have sold you to the highest bidder. This is before, before I escaped. And they said, once the highest bid is done with you, then we'll put you to the general public for prostitution. And after they are done with you as well, then we take your organs and we sell it to the red, uh, the black market. So ultimately they said, you need to resign to the fact that you're going to die. So you're never going to escape us. And the first thing that went through my mind was like, I just need to make it through make it out, tell my mom and dad what's happened, and even if I have to die, it's fine. So the death itself didn't scare me, but my parents not knowing what had happened to me really frightened me. Their obligation, that that I thought they if they live throughout their life and I just gone, I'm gone, they're never going to know what happened to me. And that was something that really drove me to make it through, to fight, to want to escape, to stay alive. To, to stay alive, to make a scene. Every time we stopped somewhere, I made a scene. That's how I escaped them. I constantly was making scenes. Were they telling you that they were going to sell you on? How much were people actually getting sold for? Did you know? I don't know, but uh, they had put, because I was a virgin, so a highest bidder had bought me. So they had sold me to the highest bidder. I don't know how much. It's fucking creepy, isn't it? It's creepy. There, there is even a market from a hell. You'd think from a healthy human mind, okay, these guys are monsters, but the buyers are too. Yeah, and those are the ones that are sitting in suits, probably sitting in fucking parliament and all over the world. I'm not saying that. I'm not. I don't have the answers and names, but it's the high end people who are walking the streets in suits and calling the shots and. I'd imagine so to be paying that sort of money. I don't know what they, what they pay, but with some of the stuff that you read, some of the girls are a hundred thousand, could be half a million. It depends who they are and what the use they can get from them. Do you think a lot of people actually buy these girls and just keep them in a house or a dungeon and nobody ever knows? All around I mean, the world. We over the years we have heard diff heard different cases. Some people believe that have I mean this is information coming from a CIA agent. I haven't done my homework myself. Yeah, same. But it's just coming from someone else, different sources. So the few that have made have escaped and they never want to speak, they just hibernate, have said the, that some of the people have been killed, their blood has been taken, organs have been taken. Some say it's constant uh, prostitution. So it's really, it's like uh, their imagination is quite wild. It's just how much money they can make. But again, yeah. it's for their own evil thrills. We talk about adrenochrome and a lot of people think it's a conspiracy, this and that. But people are getting tortured for their blood and they're paying top dollar for it. And we talk about the heart, the liver, the kidneys, the brain. People And people just, a lot of these, some of these people will be using their money just to torture people for their own thrills, for their own kicks. There's, I've spoke to people who says that they've, the high end people with a lot of money are buying human beings, setting them into the wild and chasing them to kill them. Like some sort of game. It's people putting people's life in their It's hands. like Hunger Game, you know, yeah. like they're creating these films and then lo and behold, it's almost like they're giving people idea what to do. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's always been there. I don't know if they're just rubbing it in people's face as well, some of these films. It's not as if it's giving people ideas. I just feel as if it's already there. Yeah. And they create these films to say, this is what we do. We're going to make a film of it so you think it's so far-fetched. Yeah, exactly. As if, because sometimes you think, what do they? What were they smoking to have made this film? I mean, who came <laughs> up with stuff like this? I mean, I don't do drugs. I've never done drugs, but I'm just, you know, it's a, just an expression. Like, what are these people taking to have such creepy yeah. imagination? But maybe it's coming from real life uh, events. Yeah, events. So, seeing your mind, were you constantly thinking, I need to escape? Were you, were you, casing the place and thinking, okay, there's exits here, there's a security guards there. Did you plan it with any other girls or could you speak with anybody else? 
No, I was always on my own with them. So, as I said, they would bring girls only to teach me. And then once they were sort of convinced that I knew what to do because they didn't want me to be spoiled. I was just this pristine. They wanted me to know stuff, but if I was to perform something, it was to be done to the highest bidder. So, so he can see that I'm nervous, maybe he or she, whoever bought me, because I probably would have been very nervous to have done whatever I learned. But so they, they have worked it out in such a way. So they trained me, never put me to test because they didn't want to spoil my innocence. And they knew that I was ready because like weeks of training and watching constant crazy stuff. And then, you know, but that night, uh, that night, I mean, it's a, it's a very long process because they were meant to, in the book, if people read it, because I'm just spoiling the whole book. Oh, but people, the, the power for the story, people will go and buy the book. So they will, people support you for your strength and what you've been through. So, Thank you. So well, people go, fuck me, I like her. She's unbelievable. So people will buy into not the book. Obviously, we're here to promote the book, but people with your story, people go, I'm going to buy that. So people will just buy it for support and obviously find out in more detail. But genuinely, people people come on the podcast, people gravitate towards the book because they like the individual. Mm. It's more important. So I think just being you and showing you your strength and courage, I'm not going to die. And you're thinking about all the shit that you're seeing and going through. You're still thinking, I don't want my mum and dad to suffer because it's a life sentence for them. It, 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 this is it. And it's so strong. It made me realize my love, my bond. Going back to the question you asked earlier, you said, uh, how was it like, you know, to be... Because I grew up, I was so lucky to grow, grow up with with two parents that really loved and respect each other. There was never strictness. It was very holistic way never pushed me to do anything, always did their best to educate me. And they always said, if you're going to do anything, do it in front of us so we can help you. And my dad is a doctor because drugs were big even on those days. But I was never into drugs. I was never into smoking or drinking anyway. So it wasn't something that I wanted to do. But yeah, my love for them, the way they, I just, the love they showed me just rubbed on me. And I just, it really rubs on you. It's like if somebody shows you love, then you, that really is so oh, contagious. Then you just feel that sense of thing back. And I just wanted to make it through so I could tell my mom and dad, look, this is what's happened. And I made it through. And you're okay. And even if we die, we die together. At least we all die in kind of thing. But uh, as I said, I, I made it back. I found my parents hiding in the basement. <laughs> Poor them. And, and they, in panic, they started like, my mom specifically, she's like, oh my God, you shouldn't have come back. No, no, no. And I'm like, what, mom? I have so much to tell you, you know? I just wanted to tell her, I'm like, mom, I've been kidnapped. And the love for you and, and the resilience. And I, I almost was so proud of myself that I made it through these people. She's screaming, oh my God. God, she's like blue murder. Oh my God, honey, you, you shouldn't have come back. You don't understand the danger you are in. And I'm like, what danger? You should have seen what danger I was in then. Yeah. You know, I was so young and naive that I thought that was the only danger that was lying. Because, you know, when there is a lie and there is hyenas and there is, you know, you get every kind of wild thing in the mix. But um, she was right. She was right, but I sort of under underestimated her panic and underestimated my outcome. I said, um, don't worry, mom, because she heard this van come into the garden, this truck, small, smallish kind of truck, soldiers, Serbian soldiers, they came in. And now to just identify in the book, this is mentioned, but for the people listening, in Serbia, we had normal army, which wore boots, as any army would. And then during the war, to make the numbers, what uh, Milosevic did, he recruited all the killers, murderers, rapists, any crazy people from the prisons that were with life sentence, out of prisons, put them on uniform, and put uh, trainers on them. So they knew... Who was so the soldiers can tell the difference? It was for them, not for us. Mm -hmm. But we learned it very quickly that that doesn't look right. These soldiers have got trainers and these soldiers have got boots. Why? 
So we learned it very quickly. And then the word spread very quickly. And this was way before I even made it to Kosovo. We already knew it was established. The prisoners, recruits from prisons, injured soldiers were with trainers on, mm -hmm. with uniform, and the other ones were just normal uniform. So these soldiers picked me up from my mom and dad. And to be honest, at that point, I wasn't scared. I wasn't, I'm like, mom and dad, don't worry. You know, I was so chilled about it. I said, I'm going to just tell them what had happened in Kosovo, that I was called a spy and that I got, you know, like taken, blah, blah, blah. And my mom is looking at me like, what? Because she never heard the story. And she's still screaming in the middle of the garden. My dad is holding her. They're both crying. And I just said, don't worry. I will speak to these guys. They will understand. They are our people. They are soldiers, Serbian. I'm, I don't know what I was thinking. <clears throat> And um, they took me, they didn't drive also very far. They were into the mountains very near to where we live. An abandoned building, quite run down, took me in and uh, into this small room, interrogated me. I mean, when I say interrogated me, my God, first with words, what were you doing in Kosovo? Why did you cross borders? Who are you working for? I'm like, I'm not working for anyone. You guys almost killed us. So uh, my dad asked me to go. I go there. I stayed with some Amer Americans. Then I got called a spy. So I got kidnapped by human traffic. So I'm telling the truth. No, you're lying. Okay, let's turn up the heat. So they start beating me up. And now that I start telling people this, people can see it. I had a dislocated jaw, which in fact is still it's quite sore from the beating that I got that particular day. And my nose got broken quite badly. Then it had to be reconstructed in, in the UK because I couldn't breathe. It was so badly broken. I looked like a rugby guy. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah, it's so tough. <clears throat> you got to find humor because it's the yeah. story is quite um Laughter quite deep. It numbs the pain. Yeah. And um they they really interrogated me badly. It was so painful, the beating the pushing around, psychological stuff. And the last thing they did that I remember before I fainted, after I lost teeth and my teeth were just, I, I was a mess, unrecognizable. Within a few hours, I was swollen. I couldn't see. I was just a mess. Um, they kept pulling me and throwing me and back pain. So I still have back pain. I have two slip discs as a result of that. And the last thing I remember from that interrogation before the next time I opened my eyes, that I could open my eyes, was they said, she's not telling the truth, all this beating, let's brand her. So they took this metal branding thing that they use for kettles and stuff. It was like a hashtag shape because I had it on my calf for a long time. I had to raise it, remove it. And they ha hashtag me. They, they burned my calf. And the, the, the pain, the, the instant pain when it hits you, <clears throat> I just fainted. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just fainted. I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I, I don't remember what happened. I just blacked out. It was too much for the brain to handle the pain. Yeah, that sounds... And yeah, that's it really, uh, James. And then what happened was that that was, I thought it was going to be a very easy journey. I was going to literally be held for a bit, abuse some more, you know, maybe interrogated a bit more. And then I thought they can see that I'm telling the truth and they would release me. But no, I was completely wrong. I didn't realize that that was going to be six months of uh, mental abuse physical abuse, sexual abuse, just the, 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 the hardest thing for me initially was to, to wake up in a small room, no window, damp, cold, smelly, with a blanket, not being able to see, burning calf, missing teeth, bleeding, my ear was ripped, this ear is still it's been reconstructed, but oh, just waking up like I'd fallen from, from the airplane, not even a building, and thinking that I was going to go home. And then 
you start thinking, okay, maybe today, and then you lose track of the days and the time because it's dark. You don't know what's happening. You don't know when it's night, when it's day, how many hours. How, you can't. You just can't. You have, have zero sense. So I really felt buried alive in this room for six months. The only time I left the room was when uh, initially that was my bathroom as well, and I would use it for everything that I had in me. And then I started starving myself because I, I couldn't handle, I thought I couldn't handle the the torture. It was, I just wanted to end it because my parents saw me who took me this time. So I thought, enough. It's it's no need for me to fight anymore. No need to to continue. There is no need for any of this. So I'll give in. And I thought by starving myself, by giving in, that the darkness would take me. But it wasn't my time. It just was not my time. And um, yeah, then the torture really began. The rape, uh, the rape uh, from the soldiers was quite brutal. Uh, it was just, um, it was a, a matter of me making a decision in my head. And this is something that I, now people are so much more aware of it. And I'm so, so happy for them. They are aware of how powerful our mind is and how you can block and how you can think different things to rewire your, your, yeah. Yeah, your brain and yourself and what you're feeling. Even if you, somebody's causing you harm or somebody is lashing at you or whatever, you can rewire yourself to almost block it. So I learned in that small room because I didn't know what else to do. I started meditating. Not that I knew what meditation was, but just started thinking of my mum's food, closing my eyes because I couldn't see anyway. So I might as well have my eyes closed and just thinking because <laughs> it was dark. <laughs> so I was I'm like, laughing oh. because it's fucking mad and it's funny to see you smiling. And that's the beautiful thing because life is, what is that? What is that all about? How can you go through so much torture and torment but still be here smiling? Because I know people who's not even close to what you've been through and they're miserable bastards, you know? Mm. And I'm the same. I've been through some shit, nothing, nowhere near your stuff, but I've seen some pain. I've seen family members struggling, pain with losing loved ones to like murder and suicide and overdose. I've seen struggle. I like to think I got on with it and I like to think I'm a peaceful man now, but I do think about vengeance. I do think about killing people. And that's fucking crazy. But I, I, I've seen a psychiatrist and he says, well, listen, everybody has those thoughts because I was thinking, am I going crazy? I used to think, I used to get some sort of peace of killing the people who harmed my people, you know? Did you ever think that? Uh, do you know what? I think that comes from the sense that you genuinely strongly believe that this kind of people shouldn't even exist. Mm -hmm. But then I so, used to think I'm coming to their level. It's a fine line, you know, yeah. I, James, I had to work really hard on that because I don't know if I wish them harm. I just wish they never existed or somebody harmed them in return as a karma. But then I realized that I was only hurting myself by holding on to that kind of feeling. I had to forgive them. And in order to forgive them, I had to forgive myself. So when people struggle to make peace with something, it's not because they haven't made peace with someone else. It's because they haven't forgiven themselves. And we forget, for example, how important we are to ourselves. So if you, for example, let's just take a very simple example. If you, if we're sitting here and we are very good friends, right? And you yeah. told me, oh, you are rubbish and um, you're crazy and you just judge me in every way you can, for example, then I would be like, excuse me, you don't speak to me like that. Or equally, you would say the same to me. So basically, what I'm trying to say is if you speak to a friend like you speak to your own self in here, because like, we often say, like, you're not good enough, nobody loves you, it comes all from the past experience, so we have been wired to think this way. That stays with us. The power of the word that we started this conversation with. So it comes from that, that the evil that you have has been inflicted in you by external, internal families. It doesn't matter. But if you then thought, okay, so why do you have to live with yourself by being nasty to yourself like that? Just because you can't run away from yourself doesn't mean it gives you the right 
to be so nasty to yourself. So treat yourself like a good friend and be like for me, sometimes I used to say, oh, you know, your nose is like this and your nose is like that and nobody would want you and you're this and you're that. You've been through a lot and people can't handle you. Maybe they would find you difficult when you sleep because you have nightmares, all of these things. And then I said, what? Uh, or you're not good enough because you didn't get your diploma in, in medical because the war happened. So you never went to university. And then I stopped myself. I said, hang on a minute. I'm actually brilliant because if I wasn't brilliant, I wouldn't even be here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to help others. So I tell myself every day. Affirmations. Affirmations in my head. Anytime something creeps in like nasty or somebody's just, I'll be like, no, no, no. I just like, because we, it's, it's, we are human. So we're going to shift between the two. Yeah. I feel as if I contradict myself sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And it's time. normal. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to refrain and just say, hang yeah. on a minute. Recognizing and knowing the difference. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know? So see the people who came to your mum and dad's house the second time, were they on your side? The Serbians that time were they good soldiers? Obviously, they were bad soldiers. These were but the trainer ones. They were so they were the, the evil the, ones. Yeah. So how did they know you were that the, you were at your mum and dad's? Uh, they were watching the border. So the border is literally next to my mum and dad's kind of mountain, mm -hmm. and they were with the binoculars. They were watching movement and stuff. So because they had gone and asked, they knew who lived where. I mean, how many people were in the town? At that time, yeah, or a just hundred. over. It's a big town. Yeah, it's. A few thousand? Uh, yes. A few mm -hmm. thousand. So, see, when you're going through all the pain and torment again, you fuck, so you've went from one frying pan straight <laughs> to into another. You must have been thinking, but did you know that it was always going to be this messy because it be become a war zone, or did you think everything's going to be okay? Did you, or did you realize how messy and crazy it was getting? In there, because you, you said you were going back to die with your mum and dad. I just thought I'll die from a bomb or from a shooting from a yeah. I didn't think, I didn't think that. I didn't think that was happening. I didn't know what I, and then now the, the whole perspective of war has changed for me. It's like when people say war, if you die by a bomb, it's almost like it's been, you've been blessed, a you relief. know, just a relief. you like, yeah. you know, if it's, um, anything like catastrophic from the weather and stuff or whatever it is you like you just say thank you you know because when it's inflicted by people that mean that find joy and pleasure in torturing others oh my god yeah that's a weak society you know? that's the weak men that's the the evil of the world that we talk about and people talk about good and evil i genuinely believe there's a good and evil there see when you were going through the six months did you ever realize were you still thinking of a, an escape or were you thinking of i'm going to get out did you or did you give up hope i i realized i wasn't dying from starvation and stuff and and i gave into the darkness and all of this i never thought i would escape i didn't even hope for escape i just did question i thought why is my dad not coming to get me because he knows they've taken me <clears throat> did they know where you were no, so they didn't. And so what my dad did, bless him, <clears throat> excuse me, this is not in the book, the details, but because um, the book was getting really long and then I was advised either I do two books straight and I was too tired from the stories. It's quite, draining. it's draining. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I cried a lot. I really, I have, guys, I have been crying so much writing this book. It's been cathartic. It's been such a relief because I had to recall a lot of, memories and stuff and relive them in order to to really put some content in but my dad bless him he had to he had to go and um contact during the this is all through war six months of war by that point slightly has calmed down i think but still war he had to go and contact a serbian a police guy that was really high in the police and say, look, I know, you know, it's war and you guys are all following your, your orders, but my daughter has been taken, is it? And he's been taken by soldiers wearing trainers. He didn't say the recruits because he didn't want to just, he let him say it. Yes. And the guy said, listen, I'm going to first search 
all the stations to see if she's being held in the police station, in the army bases. Is anybody, does anybody know of her? So they searched. All the legit soldiers said we would not go to that extent. If anything, we would execute. But we're not holding anyone ransom. So they had the decency to say so, the, the Serbian soldiers. But they said we can investigate to see what's going on with the other half that's been recruiters because they hated each other. Because the real soldier, soldiers felt like they were not good enough. So why did they need more recruits from some lunatics? So they weren't, they weren't really for that. Even though they were killing and still they were not for people that were mental that, that do that kind of stuff. And uh, they investigated, they found out where I was being held. And my dad's friend that worked in the police, a Serbian guy, he was our friend for always. Really, I grew up with him in the house with his kids. Uh, he then said, listen, uh, she's being held in the mountain. It's this abandoned building, but it's not our people. It's not uh, legit. So be careful. You might be able to bribe her, take her home. And then let's plan her escape because they're not going to leave her alone. And my dad, then he thought about it. He gathered loads of cash from other cousins because it's funny enough, my dad was the most educated one, yet the other cousins had the most money. So uh, he gathered from the elderly. So children never found out. And even now I'm just breaking the news to some of the people that are still alive back home that what happened to me they slowly finding out what had happened, really, because my dad, it was the embarrassment of knowing that I was with these two soldiers and potentially being raped. It was huge, even during the war, can you imagine? And the whole ordeal behind it. So he tried to save me. He tried to save me face, basically, to, to, to tell my story in my own time. And um, he found where I was, got some money, and he had come to rescue me. He had planned my escape. And I remember the soldiers coming to the door, knocking on the door, because they always knocked. they just mental. They said, um, someone's here to see you. But they've said this before. And every time they've said this, and I thought it was true, they would beat me up because I came out of the cell. And then I got beaten up a lot. They were playing games. I said, I'm not coming out in Serbia. I said, I'm, I'm staying here. They're like, come on, really, somebody's here. I was like, oh, my God. And I was so weak. I was skin and bones and deformed and infected ear and, like, infected calf. I mean, I'm surprised I didn't die from infection. And so I, I, I came and I, and I walked into this room because there's a lot of light. And I wasn't seeing much light. It was all very dingy and dark everywhere else. And my room was pitch black. When I, and I could see this person and I'm trying to make out and I'm like and I heard my dad's voice and he approached me and he, I could see the shock on his face as a doctor he looked at me up and down and they just threw me at him he grabbed me and he's looking at me and I'm looking I said dad what took you so long he's just like it's okay he just hugged me you know I could see him I could feel his trembler, trembling arms and I said, where is mom? He said, she's at home. Come on, let's go. He didn't want me to talk. He didn't want me to talk anything. Even in Albanian, he didn't want me to talk. The Serbian soldiers didn't speak Albanian, whereas we spoke both languages. He said, we're going first. So we got out into the car. My dad had exchanged some money. And they said, listen, old man, she needs to come back. 24 hours she has with you. He's like, yeah, I promise. With my life, of course took me home. I'm lying there, like covering my face because the, the bright light, uh, my eyes were hurting. It's, it's really something I think the medical people that understand or anyone that's been through something like this, going from not being able to see much to seeing so much bright light is quite... Daunting, yeah. Yeah, you can't. You can't look. And I got home. My mom was there. She grabbed me. Lots of hugs, lots of like big reunion, but I wasn't enthusiastic. I, I had, I had really the, the depression, the mental state wasn't. My mental state was not stable at all. I was, I was like a zombie. I wasn't myself, and there was no emotions. There was like this numbness about me, and 
understandably, I guess. And my mom bathed me. She got me together. I fell asleep on her lap and they then walked me up to eat. I couldn't even eat. She'd cooked so many different things. I said, I can't eat, mom. I can't. I was, I was just like really skin and bones. And she's like, you need to eat. And then they shush, shush her in something. They like saying something. And I'm like, what are you guys going on about? My dad said, it's time. You should have seen the look on my face. I almost want to see that look on my face as well. I think my face said it all. I just looked at him and I said, Dad, just enough. You know, I didn't, it's not time. What time for what? You know, it's like, it's literally, I didn't have the will in me anymore. I didn't, there was not, nothing left in me that I wanted to go any further. I just wanted to, then I think I would have died if I stayed with my parents on those few days. I think I would have probably died because I <laughs> I reunited with them again and it was just it was enough. But my dad <laughs> so stubborn. He's like, We are going. I'm like, okay, dad, for the last time. I've never spoke back at you. I will never speak till I die. I love you. Uh, your wish is my command. I said, whatever you say. He said, say goodbye to your mom. This is our last time. And that was tough. So tough. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Didn't mean to break down, but... You know, when you say those last goodbyes, I didn't even know where I was going. He never told me anything. I just walked with him slowly, reached this, uh, we reached uh, the the motorway, sort of motorway, the leads that goes through Serbia into the other kind of countries. So it's a big motorway. And there was a truck that did export, import for goods, even during the war. And he gave it to this man. And I'm looking at the driver and I'm thinking, oh my God, what now? Because for me, I lost all trust in all humankind at that point. He said, listen, he said, you are okay. This has been planned. He said, the driver... When you reach the destination, the driver has been told what to do. He was a Spanish driver. So with the police, my dad, they had arranged for me to be transported, uh, shipped to the UK, basically. And uh, sorry, I'm so dodgy. I was an illegal immigrant in the country. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so uh, I said goodbye and I looked at my dad for the last time. Uh, I don't know, I felt that void and that that emptiness. And I thought, wow, that's the last time. And what for, for what? I didn't want to live anymore. I didn't want to carry on, you know, life without them. It wasn't... It didn't really have a meaning... So I made it to the UK <laughs> as a illegal immigrant, but a uh, political asylum seeker as a child. I was still, by that point, I was turning 18 and so on. So or a bit older, I think. I don't know, really. I lost track. But uh, the governments were really uh, very, very welcoming. Uh, not like, oh, yeah, welcome, but kind of, my God, this kid needs a lot of help. And, you know, my mom's cousin was we'll based here. Sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you don't have any people that cry, do you? <laughs> they all cry, to be fair. It must be me. Aye. Should I leave this here? Yeah. Oh, thank you, James. I, I needed this. So yeah, I came to the UK, 
my mom's first cousin was here. He was also, he ran away from Bosnia because he was studying medical. He's a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was studying in uh, Bosnia when war hit. He took the last flight, last plane that left Bosnia before the bombing uh, United Nations went in mm -hmm. or something like that. And uh, he didn't even know I was coming. Nobody knew anything. My, the driver just had a number to to call when he got to the UK. And he did. And then uh, just, excuse me, he delivered to, to my uncle that I've never met before. Uh, I've never met him, ever. Maybe when I was a baby, may, might have seen me as a baby, but that's it. And uh, he was very kind to me uh, as a psychiatrist, especially understanding the level of... <sighs> Once I told him the story... He was so shocked. He was just in disbelief what had happened to me. He could see it physically. Visibly, it was very visible, everything that he saw, but he just couldn't believe that I made it through, that the resilience, you know, he, he found it fascinating. He said, this is so helpful to, he said, I'm sorry to say this, but he saw me heal and he saw me go through stages. He said, it's helpful for me as a psychiatrist to see someone overcome because there is always a possibility. There is always a chance if you don't give up. But he wasn't my doctor. He wasn't my psychiatrist because he's too close to home. And I think I needed a female psychiatrist. So I was appointed to a female doctor that I work with. But, you know, James, the answer always when you have a depression or or some kind of post-traumatic uh, stress it's so easy. I was like, oh, let's put her on drugs, like, you know, antidepressant. And there wasn't the answer. And I, I will encourage, and no, I'm not going to encourage anyone. People can do what they want. But if if a friend asked me if they were under, under medication as such as I was, and they said, should I stay? Or what do you suggest I do? If they are stable and they're not like literally, if they're not doing it for any other reasons just because they've been through a stressful time, I would say speak to your doctor, doctor and trying to wean yourself off because you're only numbing the issue and you are not healing because when you're on antidepressant, you feel nothing. So the the desire to heal yourself, it doesn't even exist. Your body is numb. The senses are numb. So this really good doctor, German doctor practicing in the UK, he helped me get off my medications, which was good. Once that was done in a proper way, weaning off gently so I don't have the side effects mm -hmm. and my will to really not be on them anymore, I just exhaled in life. I wanted to then work. I wanted to learn. I wanted to study and I continued to study and then it just continued to flourish because my mind was numb and I, I can understand they were worried about me. They needed to do something. They couldn't babysit me. And that was the answer. But long term, there was not the answer. Yeah, long term. Any pharmaceutical drug is going to affect the body negatively. Yeah. But at a stage, if people are so at that line where they want to not be here, then sometimes these things can help just at that moment and can help save you to numb the brain and hopefully you can push through it. But... For me, doctors aren't talking about what's your nutrition like. How much trauma have you got? How do you exercise? What sort yeah. of nutrition are you eating? The doctors aren't going to tell you to go into nature and do cold water therapy and exercise and eat clean and talk right. They just go, listen, I'm making money. I'm your drug dealer. There you go. Numb the pain. It will tell you on the box. You can still go suicidal by taking this. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. But for me, if you're really struggling, if you are drinking, taking drugs, gambling, womanising, if you're doing all those things and you you feel as if you get mental health, if you can eliminate them and you're still struggling, then seek help. But if you're not exercising, not eating good, if mm. you're drinking drugs, you're going to be struggling, you're going to be have some sort of mental breakdown along the way. It might not take a year, it might take 10 years, but if you can eliminate drink, if you can eliminate drugs, even caffeine, Start eating right, exercise and speaking right. Your mind does become a lot clearer. My life is going amazing. I always repeat this, but I still struggle. But I'm just, no, I'm the individual. You're struggling today. Fucking do something about it. I'm in charge. 
nobody else. But it can be difficult, especially when you talk about trauma, PTSD, because everybody's got different levels of yeah. trauma and PTSD. Someone can break a foot at work or in a car crash and their whole life can be ruined by that sort of trauma. They can't go outside, they can't Absolutely. go in a car. But there comes a stage where you need, if you fight enough and fight against it and push through it, you will start creating changes. So when you started working on yourself, when did you... St- like you say, you still think about it day in, day yeah. S- certain smells, certain even music or whatever it is, it'll bring back the emotion because the brain's such a powerful tool. The brain releases the chemicals. You're speaking about this. The brain releases the chemicals to actually what you felt that day. The brain is such a powerful fucking big <laughs> muscle or, or whatever they want to call it. It's just a big sponge of intelligence. The same as It's your the gut. last thing to die. Yeah. So our heart will die before our brain. That's why they say, you know, uh, it's the fl- life flashes before your eyes. Yeah, because the hearing, our brain, is the last thing mm-hmm. to die. So, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's but okay, you're quite so. right, I'm agreeing. And the level of, like, you, you mentioned this, and it's so important for people to understand. Please don't compare yourselves to to me or anyone else. If you've gone through something, and we all have been. Mm-hmm. I meet people every day. They go When you think they have it all sorted out, you'll be surprised people go through stuff. And it doesn't matter because it's like what I've learned is the doctors will say, okay, let me see your injury from one to ten. How painful is it? Well, my tan, it could be completely different to someone else's. My five, you know what I mean? So yeah. it can't be measured from one to ten. My mm-hmm. My... You know, intolerance, uh, intolerance, my actual tolerance to pain is different maybe to other people because my body has endured so many other pains that it's become immune to pain. So, you know, I'm not, I'm just taking, yeah, talking about it's physical like a boxer stuff. Who can inspire every day, have fights. Yeah. You will be able to tolerate that pain compared to the average person who's never done it and getting punched. Yeah. It's just, you've went through so much pain, you've actually not accepted it, but it becomes. I wouldn't even say normalized because it ain't fucking normal, but it just, you go through it. Sometimes you can go through it. It's like people in abusive relationships, people, yeah. they, it's like they go back and because the, the brain is so used to going back and forth and back and forth, do they love me or do they not love me? They're going back to that torment, but when you can get in a conscious state and think about in that conscious state, is this the right thing in life or is it the wrong thing? You can actually make the deci- the best decisions are made, obviously, when you're in a conscious frame. Subconscious mind controls your day. It's like robotic. But it's to break that mold and make the changes. And no matter who you are, and I'll always repeat this, you can have better in life. If people could see their lives, if they could see their true potential, they'd fucking hate who they are. And there's nowhere, people not even anywhere near the trauma and pain you went through, but yet they're suicidal, they're still unhappy, and they're miserable, and they don't want to go on. And it's sad. It's so sad that people actually feel depressed. It's so sad that people actually want to give up. It's so sad that they don't think there's hope there's always hope you're living proof even though times you try to starve yourself and you never was the food what was the food like in the in that yeah. cell horrible Shite. oh my god it's like i mean i mentioned the details about the food was like like soup kind of like, stew mince yeah ugh. yeah but i lost my taste buds anyway you know after a while james a lot of senses you know you don't crave i think we go through life going coming back to life now mm-hmm. We go through life thinking, oh, I need this to exist and I need that. Honestly, you don't need much to exist and to be happy. Yeah. You, I think we just, external factors, I think we yeah. just... Yeah, I feel as if as human beings we crave more. We're very, we can speak a good game. No, I speak a good game. I understand, but I still like to find, I've got nice watches. I retired my mum, which is one of my biggest achievements. Do you know what I mean? Retired, yeah. that house paid off, money in the bank, wage every month. That's your son. That's what I've done for you. You, I've got you. You put up with all my shit for years in prison and police and addictions and misery. And I was never a bad kid, but I done bad shit just to try and fit in. But it was um, I, look. If we know the answers, then why do I work so much? Why am I on the road? Why am I? I like nice things, nice clothes, nice car, nice house because we know we don't need that shit to be happy. Yeah, we know. But it's okay to have nice things, I get it, but I, the more I, I've got all that, the more I realise, well, how am I not still happy? Because I know I've still got a lot of stuff internally to work with a lot of demons and face them. And as a man, you don't really... We pretend a lot. We're the great pretenders, men. 
We're scared. We're scared more than any other species in human on this planet. You know, James, I think this comes down to the fact that over time we have told boys to man up. Mm. You can't cry because you're not man enough. You, If you cry, you are not man enough. So it's like we, we, we make p- boys feel this way. I think they are vulnerable and you'd be surprised once people trust you, uh, me as a woman, for example, or as a coach, because I coach a lot of people and uh, VPs and MDs of companies and stuff. And when we work on one-to-one, I am so grateful when they open up to me because I know there is a shift happening and they don't have to be vulnerable to the world, but just be vulnerable to yourself and the person you trust because you can go through life pretending so strong, but eventually it's going to catch up with you and it's just going to start impacting. It's like, I, I watch relationships where people go, oh, we've just drifted apart because, I don't know, he doesn't really say much. He's always working. He's always, yeah, he's working because he's trying to provide. But he's also not saying much because maybe there is stuff to be said that he's trying to not bother you with. Mm-hmm. So it's so important for them, for men to find somewhere to turn like the soldiers or anyone really i mean even people that are in really high like pressure jobs to be able to say things to someone they trust even if they just say it or write it down for me it started by writing down i didn't know i will ever publish a book but i started writing things down because it was a a relief therapeutic yeah and then you you don't have to think about it you write it and you're like yeah it's 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 helpful the majority of suicide is male so something's yeah. not right there's something's no. not right in the male psyche where we don't feel good enough to be here and that fucking breaks my heart that there's a man out there or even listener watching this they think i'm not good enough i'm not good enough for my girlfriend i'm not a good son or i'm just shit at my job or whatever but everybody's got a purpose everybody's got meaning in life and it's just how we see the world because there's people i know who's got less than me that are happier than me They've been told that they're not good enough. So it starts from childhood. Yeah. It's very important. It's the brain, but that's why affirmations are important for me. Every morning yeah. I love myself, I am good enough. Just repeat that. But sometimes it doesn't always work. So it's okay me saying do this and do that. It doesn't always work. I'll do cold water therapy. I'll, I'll exercise and I'm, I know I'm successful now. I know I'm doing well. It doesn't mean nothing if up here is like a fucking war zone. It's like just little bombs click creep off from time yeah to time. that's when you need to go back to because this this actually came up in conversation i was doing a motivational speech with a newspaper here in the, in the uk and this came up because what we sometimes forget we focus on all we're doing the right thing now but we're not actually understanding why is it not working it could be something as simple as for me i have to be careful what i listen to so you think you're listening to music but the words within the music so that kind of stuff, because that brain is listening, although we're not aware of it. Mm. So now when I wake up in the morning, I don't listen to the news. And they said to me, what do you do first thing in the morning? How do you motivate yourself? And this is me speaking to the newsroom. Mm. <laughs> and I just say things as they are. I said, my advice is don't listen to the news. And I didn't even realize I was speaking to the news. I, I wasn't really doing it on purpose. And they all started laughing. Mm. Why? Because they also realized that the news sometimes can be what people listen to the first thing in the morning you know yeah. we don't wake up at the wrong side of the bed if if that was true then i would wake up every morning really up like crazy because my dreams wake me up you know yeah. I, i'm going through that every night mm-hmm. of kidnapping fighting la, la, la. it's always like a real fight in my sleep yeah. so if that was true then i would wake up but as soon as i wake up i'm like ah, mm-hmm. i'm here nope that was just a dream thank god yeah. <laughs> So how you, your, how's your life been since you've been in the UK? How did you then turn your darkness into light? What did you do? Was it just steady progress of trying to face your demons, face the pain? Initially, really, didn't I didn't really fully heal t- till much later. But it started, it started with me joining a gym at the school that I was going to Hammersmith. It was Hammersmith West College or something like that. It was called in Byron's Court. And it was a gym for the students. So I started going to the gym. I didn't know what I was doing in the gym. And the power of exercise and just releasing a bit of energy, it was amazing. But what happened was a lot of trainers would come to me and say, 
And this is when I could speak only very little English. Oh, are you trying to lose weight? And I was skin and bones anyway. Oh, are you trying to build muscle? Oh, the, the, and I'm like, why are they asking me this question? I didn't understand. It was so, didn't mean anything to me. What I was going there, and I, I said it to them. I said, no, actually, I'm here because I feel good. It makes me feel good. And they looked at me like, okay, crazy girl. So my drive immediately thought, do you know what? These people got it all wrong. I need to get into fitness industry. And I always wanted to help people because as a doctor, I wanted to help people. And that's why I wanted to be a doctor. So I became a fitness uh, personal trainer and worked in different gyms in London. And they're all very well-established gyms until I set up my own business. But I always focused on making people feel good in order to see changes. Because unless you can train your client at their max and have heavy lifting, fix their diet, all of this, if they're not mentally happy, and you're not, it's not your job to make everyone happy, but it's how you use reverse psychology for them to make those decisions to make themselves happy, to think happy thoughts and how they see themselves and how you are with them. And it was working. I became one of the most busiest personal trainers, female trainers in London. I mean, like I was being recruited by, by different gyms. They're like, come and work for me. Come and I'm like, nope. And then I was just working for myself. But J Jewish community, Muslim community, they all loved me because I'm trustworthy. Did people know your story? They didn't. Nobody knew the story, only just recently Did the story. Do you feel as if that was a fresh chapter? You could be somewhat, not be, you would always be yourself, but do you feel as if it was a, a, not an escape either because you've still lived that life, but it was like a new beginnings. But do you feel as if that life didn't exist or was it always there? You're right. It was like, it was almost like a, a different, different ident identity. I, I had the same name and the last name, but it was a different ident identity in a sense that. I didn't have to talk about it to anyone. Nobody knew. I never wanted people to know. I was so ashamed of what had happened. So I still hadn't healed from the shame. I hadn't forgiven myself. I felt this guilt, the guilt that I walked out of the two American police officers' apartment and then I got kidnapped, the guilt of going back home and the suffering that my mom and dad they had to go through because of me. So I always blame myself. And being able to be with his families that had it, what I thought they had it all sorted out, which in in external way it did look like they were, I mean, they were like multi-billionaires kind of families. And you go into their world from somebody that's come from that, they have no idea who you are. They just love you because you are kind and you, you're just the way you approach them. And just because you deliver and they keep you in the family, they're like, okay, you're training my grandpa, okay, you're training our kids, and they trust you, once you're in, you're in, kind of thing, but they had no idea who I was, in terms of my history, mm -hmm. I just said, uh, I'm from Serbia, and that's it, they never quizzed me, or anything, and um, I never showed signs of distress, that I had things going on with me, and that was such a good distraction for me, but I forgot about me. I forgot myself. I completely forgot that number one needed healing. Yes, exercise was helping me. Yes, fixing my face and, you know, with surgery eventually and everything else. Yes, those external stuff. It helped me gain some confidence and, and look more like me before I got beaten up. But ultimately, my soul, my confidence was sh like to the ground. It was like non-existent. So... It was hard for me initially to start dating men, to date anyone. That that whole thing was, um, I pretty much married a second, pretty much second guy that I dated, a third guy that I dated in the UK. Is that like a protection thing or was it? We no, just I just... So, I was listening, could have been love or were you just craving something to love you? Did you ever crave love or were you just so distant from it? You didn't trust that you could be loved? I never wanted to be with anyone, men or women. Safer in it. <laughs> yeah, never. Honestly. It's safer. Uh, genuinely. <laughs> then 
I ended up meeting an American guy. We were together for two years. He had to go back well, to American. the States. Yeah, he was American. What was that connection with Americans? I think maybe yeah. that's my, it was my weakness. I think it was my, the, the closest Comfort. I could get to my two American police officers mm. in a, in a spirit world kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, and then Matt and I broke up, which was fine. I mean, it was, it was a decision we both made because he moved to the States. I didn't want to go to the States. And, and then I don't know who was in between Matt and James, but it wasn't that fucking I don't think actually <laughs> no, actually someone before Matt and then Matt was my last. And then I met my husband James. And um what was it? I fell in love with him. He was the most normal person I met in terms of something that I would have picked if I never had war kind of thing. He came from a very hum humble background, teachers, his parents were teachers. And I didn't know this, but you could just start feeling, I, I felt familiar side to him. Mm. You know, I could relate to him because other guys, for example, Matt was a banker. It was wealthy and completely the opposite of what I was used to. And uh, one before that was, um, super wealthy Jewish guy. So he was like, okay, when I met James, not that he's not successful, he's a successful guy, but I felt his well, upbringing was different. It matched yours. It matched mine. So you, I needed that match. I wasn't ready to go into the billionaire's lifestyle. I wasn't ready to go into the millionaire's lifestyle. I just, I wasn't seeking any of that lifestyle. It was just Universe was sending it my way. Yeah. They treated me well. They were both gentlemen. But ultimately, you know, months after splitting up with my American boyfriend, I, I met James. And it, it was familiar. We met in the gym. We had those kind of exercise in common. We would run together. He was into Great healthy... Name. Yeah, we love Great James. Name. Oh, James, I can do magic. <laughs> I have a tattoo on my arm. Yeah. Your name, I knew I was coming today. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, we we um, huh. we then decided to get married and uh, we have two boys and yeah, so it's good. Life's good. How, do, how is it for the men when you tell them your story? Because some men would think, fuck, that's heavy. Oh, gosh. Because that's baggage. That's a lot of baggage. You need, and you would, you would need a strong man, because yeah. you'll go through a lot of healing process, and you'll still struggle. So you would need a man to understand that, a man who understands you, and underst Obviously, you bring so many great attributes, but the sadness and the darkness, which comes from time to time, which you'd imagine with everybody who struggles, but you would need somebody who can guide that to yeah. a place of feeling safe, and that's hard to find. What's it like when you drop that bomb? I never dropped the bomb with anyone other than James. What did he say? And I just remember he was moving in because he had his own apartment and I had my own little apartment in South Kensington area. And he started leaving toothbrushes and stuff. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, oh, but do you mind? Because I'm spending a lot of time here. I'm like, okay. And then um, he, because we were together, he could see that I was... I didn't know I was having so many nightmares until the, these guys started telling me that you wake up a lot in the night, you know. In fact, James once caught me. Was it James or Matt? I was about to jump through the window from the fifth floor. I didn't know I was doing it, but I was escaping from something. I think it was Matt that caught me, actually, and uh, my ex. And so when I told James, he... He was getting serious. I knew this was getting serious. I, w I met his mom and the guy was totally in. I, I could feel it. He was to propose. <laughs> but I said, James, listen, I need, I said, we're getting into a really serious relationship. I said, I need to, I need to tell you stuff. And still I held a lot of information back because I was worried the level, the depth and the embarrassment. I said, I've been kidnapped and this is what happened to me. And he said, it's fine nothing changes i was like really i said you need to know though because you know just in case it's like doesn't doesn't bother me he said i'm here for you and that's when i realized that he was a really really good guy because it's true uh, there's uh, the guys that have heard the story most recently now that the fact that the book is out they say oh that story really plays on my mind that story really got me doesn't i'm like come on dude i mean 
it is my story. I don't want people to feel like overwhelmed with it. They should yeah. be inspired and say, hang on a minute. So this woman's still alive? Okay, good. There is hope. So the whole idea of doing the book is not for revenge. It's not for to feel sorry for me. It's literally for hope that we are stronger than we give ourselves credit. And don't let yourself go through torment just because you don't believe in yourself. Just try and find solutions and see what works for you. This yeah. is the whole thing. There is always hope. But yeah, I mean, it's been great. And then James always really encouraged me to exhale, like in terms of business and as a coach. And um, I became really established in the uh, fitness world and I was enjoying it so much. And I, I'm just so natural at coaching. And I worked hard in working with people and I study on the side, not diploma or anything, but I would read lots of psychology books and re like how to use reverse psychology to help people rather, not manipulate. And so I was able, I'm always able to talk to anyone and anything and everything about whatever, because I match people's energy and I'm, I, I always try to, to see where, where I'm at with people before I, mm -hmm. so I'm never fully me when I'm with people because it just depends on their energy, but I'm always peaceful unless I'm being attacked. So yeah. no attacking, wow. <laughs> martial art train. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, then I set up my business in, uh, I was doing personal training, but what happened, James, is that I have two slip discs as a result of my, um, my kidnapping and uh, my kidnapping, my six months in prison and illegal prison. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize that my back was really getting worse because I was so in the moment. I was younger. I was like fit. And because I had strengthened my back so much, it just took, it took something. It took lifting. I had this little scooter and I was trying to put it into the stand and I lifted it and I was strong, you know, I mean, always slender, but very strong. And I just felt my back. I thought, this is not right. So I called emergency and they said, well, you've got really bad slip discs here. They, they've been there for a long time. You need an operation and potentially you're going to be on the wheelchair. So we suggest you stop with your personal training. You can't run. You can't do this. You can't do that. My whole world just uh, can't, can't, can't. And I'm like, you don't tell me what I can and can't. In my head, I'm yeah, very yeah, stubborn. Yeah. And of course, I, I ended up not um, doing personal training anymore, but I retrained myself. And then my mentor, Gilles Lagoni, which I mention literally in every speech I do, he completely changed my life. He made me aware of healing was possible. So I got to work a lot on, I said, Gilles, listen, I don't think I can do personal training anymore for you or anyone that I train. So I'm going to be on a wheelchair. And I said, it's tough. He said, how did this happen? So I said, listen, nobody knows my story. But he said, oh, I, he told me his story. I told him my story. He said, Loretta, listen. He said, I, I'm seeing you on stage doing motivational speeches you're gonna have a book and he's not he's not like a some kind of person that sees the future but he was saying it for me so i believe in myself i'm like Gilles, i'm not public speaking or anything i'm not doing a book ah he said but what if i told you you did a book and you could help a charity and i was like Mm, that sounds interesting because for me, charity is everything, being able to make a difference to others. So it was never about me. It's always about helping others. He said, listen, I'll let you know which university to go to retrain yourself in public speaking. You can even do it from a wheelchair. Oh, I said, really? Could I? He's like, yeah, wheelchair. Fine. It's fine. You'll be fine. So I got it into my head. I was going to be on a wheelchair because of the injury, so I could do motivational stuff. That's fine. I was happy, still happy. And then uh, I changed my career. So I still remain a lifestyle coach, like helping people manage really more with their mindset and stuff. But then I extended it in terms of presentation skills, confidence, how to structure a presentation, how to do keynote speaking, and worked with big companies. I mean, WPP, Sir Martin Sorrell got me into one of their conference, twice into their conferences to participate. He, he loved the whole idea. He heard about my story. 
And then my job also and my husband's job took us all the way to Singapore. So I had a real adventure. I went from this to amazing life in London and just trying to show people I'm not showing off, but and still not being multimillionaires or anything, but just how you can go through life, how quickly things can change if you just start thinking positive and you crave again that success and being happy. Success is being happy. And then ultimately, if you need more money and stuff to support the family, that's fine. But there we moved to Singapore. I set up my business there and I was working. My kids were growing and I had the confidence in me to start because I was demonstrating storytelling when you present a lot of people present but they never really use storytelling whether it's their personal story to, story about how they came to be at the company and why they're doing what they're doing and why this they're presenting what they're presenting so linking their stories i was doing storytelling demonstration but i use my story a little bit to then demonstrate why i'm doing why i changed careers and why i'm doing this and I started using that story a lot because I used it at the Academy of Public Speakers as well. And everyone stood up applauding me. And that was the first time I ever spoke of my story. And from then on, I kept using my story, but no book. And people were like, where is the, have you done a book? And I'm like, oh God, <laughs> this is, uh, I never, I don't want to do a book. You know, it's like too much. It's too, too uh, vulnerable. No, they, everyone was like, you've got to do a book. We want to buy a book. And then I said, okay, I got to do a book. So I did a book. And now it's like, oh, you got to do a documentary. I'm like, yep, I'm going to do a documentary. I don't say no to anything now. Film. You got to do a film. Yes. Who do we get to do a film? Hopefully someone that's listening <laughs> uh, contacts me. I'm still, I have been approached actually a couple of different uh, filmmakers, but I'm just, I go with my gut feeling now. So we'll see. Yeah, your gut and your intuition is so yeah. important. If you can live a clean life, your intuition, you can feel and see things differently from most who are intoxicated by the bad shit in life. I'm very good. I'm very in tune. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. Yeah. yeah. Bad decision I make, I can only hold my hands up. I fucked up. But it's not, no one to blame because I'm in such, I don't drink, I don't take drugs. So the only thing I struggle with is eating. I eat my emotions. Yeah. I sugar. I eat. If I'm feeling sad, I'll eat. It's a comfort. But, that's something I will master because I want to lead by example. I want yes. people to see, fuck me, he's came from addiction and pain and all the shit and least flying high in life. Flying high in life, I'd like to see as a happiness. Yeah. Not what car I drive or what I'm wearing as is, is, is a happiness. How He's just got good energy. That's for me, flying high in life, no matter what you're doing. And it's important. Why do you think you're still alive? Me? Yeah. Why am I still alive? I... I don't think my mission is finished yet. Mm -hmm. So I have this feeling that once I accomplish my mission, I really don't think I'm here by accident. I don't think I am anything special. And whether people believe in reincarnation, whether the people believe in God and, the, you know, whatever, whatever, I was sent here for something. I genuinely think we all have a purpose. And I don't think I am special that I made it through. You know, I'm not some kind of superhero. I'm not a Wonder Woman to have made it through all of that and still survive. You know, I'm made of flesh and bones and what have you, you know, flesh and blood. But I think it's made me realize I, I still haven't accomplished my mission until the mission is done. Even if my birth chart this lady in the States, which I, I've always been skeptical, being raised as a Muslim, you sometimes don't even, I believed in star signs, I used to look at the stars, whatever, and always ask people, what's your star sign? But I still do, actually, and then Aquarius. I don't remember their name, but I remember the star sign. You're Aquarius. Mm. Oh, nice. <laughs> you see, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> uh, Aquarius are nice people, you know, yeah, very, very nice. Truthful, oh, they are very deep. And so I think my mission is not done. So when my mission is done, I have this feeling and I will know when it happens. <clears throat> I think that's when I will leave planet Earth. I don't think I would live long. I don't think I would live old. I don't know, James, I've always said this and somebody listening will think I'm mad, but I have this feeling that I know when time is. I think I'm going to be so aware of it because 
I know it's not done. And what is it not done? What is it my mission? For me is to leave this world, hopefully in a better place than it was. And I survived so I can tell the story. Maybe I survived and by telling the story, I will save lives. People that are suicidal, people that have second thoughts of whether they should or shouldn't or why me and why. Hopefully someone would listen. And I always said, if I could just help one soul, one person, then my mission is done. But I didn't realize by now I've helped millions of people. Yeah. And I know because they write to me and they say, thank you and thanks for opening up. And sometimes even when I think that some of my opening up is quite lame because it's like, what the heck was I thinking? people still come in and say, I needed that. And I'm like, wow. So I just follow my instinct and I know my mission is done. I think if, as and when, I should say, the documentary is done and hopefully it will do really well, I know then I can do more charity. Sales of the book is only going to help a charity and myself to be able to travel more and do... I, I don't have the book because I want to be a millionaire from the book. I have the book because I want people to read it and say oh my God, okay, hang on a minute, I can do it too. If if I was a multimillionaire or billionaire, I probably will give all the copies for free and then, you know, just donate money to charity myself. But people buy the book, they help a charity. Yeah, you need to survive as yeah, well. Yeah, you know, do so you we have a, to. Yeah, do you have a question? Why me? Why me for this? Why, I, I always went thought... Through all the shit you went through, do you ever think, why me? Why was I brought in this here? to go through that i have asked this question for so long and i said why me why did i cause this and i thought i was you never the cause caused anything, though. i know but you do as a as a so james look <clears throat> we can all be victims of something and that's not a choice so you can be a victim of war victim of anything it's not your choice it's out of your control but you have a choice to be a survivor and a thriver of the very thing that was meant to destroy you. So why me? Maybe is because this it goes way back to when my love with my parents was so strong. Mm -hmm. And we say in, in, in our Muslim culture, we say, God doesn't throw anything your way that you can't handle. Because sometimes you question God, you say, oh, why God are you doing this to me? It's a test. If you go to university, you're going to face some really tough tests. And now are you going to say, oh, why me? Why are you giving me this test? You are there to learn. You are there to pass. You are there to, to, to go beyond that when you went in. i much rather die to have gone through this than to die and never have felt anything, never have made a difference, never have had these feelings because regardless whether it's pain or pleasure the feeling that we feel it, it awakens up everything in us so in order to know love we need to know pain you know that kind of yeah. stuff so people have asked would what could you change if you could go back in time what would you change and i said nothing nothing i said what do you mean nothing you would go through that again i said yep and now I know how to do it. <laughs> uh, I don't want to set you off again, but what happened to your mum and dad? Oh, gosh, I try not to say too much about what happened to them. I'm going to just leave it for people's imagination. Okay. But my dad suffered two heart attacks. They were taken. They were really, really badly abused. Mm. And um, it's not my place to say too much, especially because my mom is involved in this. I'm just going to leave it with this. Okay. But she then uh, ended up uh, suffering with pancreas, uh, with, sorry, with um, ovarian cancer. Almost died. Luckily, the war had finished, so they caught the cancer on time. She had everything removed. And my dad, two heart attacks, which often people don't make it, and, and he's never had a, a surgery or anything. 
And then I asked them the same question after we re re reunited eventually, after five or six years, after I became a British citizen, because I couldn't travel to Serbia or anywhere near those countries, because we didn't know how safe it was for me. So I needed to be British in order for the British government to be able to protect me in case I get taken or I get imprisoned, because they didn't know if I was on the waiting, uh, on the wanted list, because I escaped. And so... I said to my mom and dad, I said, I would like to know, uh, how did you, how did you make it through? I mean, because they told me bits at a time, not everything at once. They said, it's you. So it was always us between each same other. Feeling. Yeah, same feeling. And then we cried. And they said, but what about you? Because I never have told them till actually most recently the details of what's going through my mom is reading the book now she's like oh my god i'm reading in english <laughs> and said mom you speak so many languages she said it's so tough she said i didn't you never opened up to me that much i said well and um it's, it must be really tough for her to read the book yeah but your family is so strong and you're not opening up to her fully as, as a protection for her because you're that you're such a good person that you don't even want to give them the pain that you felt, so you bottle it up. I understand that. Yeah, such a strong bastard, man, and I fucking love you to bits for that. And that's an amazing thing. And you should be proud of everything you've achieved and everything you've overcome and everything that you still do. Because the pain and misery is always there. I don't give a fuck how much money we make or how successful we become. The darkness is always there. There's always clouds there hanging over. Yeah, and, and it's just down to you. Okay, am I going to have a dark day? Am I going to have a sunshine day? And for me, it's to no matter who you are, your prime example that people can go on. Who the fuck gets tortured and put through misery and doesn't know if they can see their mum and dad again? Then come to the UK, and I've got to take my hat off to the UK because that's an amazing thing to be taking people in and and helping them and giving them health care and and work and that's the that, 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 that you've got to give credit where credit's due that's what i believe in if people are genuinely coming over for a better life then by all means fucking accept them i don't accept the people who are coming over here and causing torture and pain and more destruction because the uk is already on its ass yeah but if people are willing here to make it a better place and work, work hard and bring goodness to it by all means of course come anywhere you want but because the UK, there's plenty of people here immigrate, there's plenty of people here do things and if we talk about the British Army, they've invaded nearly every other fucking country, they've caused so much destruction and pain. Do you know what I mean? I just, if everybody could think a healthier, happier life, the world would be amazing, but it's not. See when, because you've in photos with Tom Hardy and stuff, do you do? Like Muay Thai and MMA. Ah, oh, Tom Hardy, yeah. yeah. Oh, He's got a great story, he, he's unbelievable. I gave Tom my book. I met him, he came for a semi, uh, well, it was a guy from the States actually, Tom, which has become my friend. And you know, this is why I do my story because I reached out to Tom De Deblas. Uh, he's based in the US, he teaches Jiu Jitsu. And I said, Tom, you're doing a seminar in London and I'm a bit delayed buying a ticket at our academy at uh, Roger Gracie. I said, I would really love to attend. I said, you're your technique and just the way you are, the way you support the soldiers, the charity uh, reorg. I said, I really want to be there. He said, I will get you in. He said, it's my seminar and I will get you in. I was like, okay. So, and he came and then I gave Tom de Blas uh, my book and Tom Hardy was there because Tom and the other Tom from the US, they close. But Tom also, Tom Hardy also trains with my friend uh, Tomaso. He's, um, He's a, a Polish guy and they've got a, an academy in Richmond. And so I, I know where Tom trains all the time, but it was just the timing was just perfect. I didn't get into the depth of what Tom has been through, Tom, Tom Hardy, yeah, yeah, I but I gave him the book and he just quickly read the front and he just looked at me. I said, Tom, come on, let's do a picture. He's like, yeah. Like, you know, the way he is, he's just such a cool dude. He is so respectful. He is so humble at the same time. At least he was at the, uh, at the academy. He was so patient. The amount of people that wanted to take pictures with him, he took pictures with everyone. He was in no rush, just a super guy. And, um, yeah, maybe I get Tom to, uh, 
to direct my movie. Yeah. Maybe I get him involved. <laughs> He's a great actor, man. Eh? If he, he is a, such a good actor. And like I say, with the backstory, not many people know, but I know people who know him and it's quite a dark story for what he's overcoming. It's amazing. And that's what it's all about. Everybody struggles. Everybody's in pain. Everybody, but you can make a better day. You can make a better year. You can make a better life, but it's all down to the individual and how much work you want to put in. What's your plans for the future? Oh gosh, uh, more plans. Gosh, I would love to do the documentary because I think it sticks so close to the bone. It's so raw. You know, I'd love in a documentary to do something unique. I would like to seek survivors of similar kind of uh, ordeal. I would, I'd love to speak and see if they want to be part of my documentary because I want to give other people a chance to heal. They don't realize how healing it is when you start speaking out and making a difference. And then uh, I want to do a movie, and ultimately these are just the the projects. But my biggest mission is to create a movement where we do we put people through. I mean, it's a it's a it's a long process, but we we create programs and activities that people can come, and it's like a round table thing everybody from the same background kind of thing not necessarily kidnapping but from the same feeling and it comes as like a safe place to to talk to do to do the activities to do some reprogramming do some challenges a bit like SAS mm -hmm. but on steroids if I can even say that <laughs> yeah. yeah so um it's really I'm impressed in in a sense how even the SAS guys, some of them have heard about my story and some might even read the book. Actually, some of them have read the book. And the feedback I have gotten, I cried. And they said, one of them particularly said, think of me as Peter and Brian. Mm -hmm. and, I, and he's still in the SAS. I was like, us. He does jiu-jitsu. I said, I really appreciate that. So... I feel very passionate about making a difference, continue to make a difference. I just need to look at other ways and creating platforms where we can start, yeah. you know, help the masses. And you can always use this platform if you ever need to, if any survivors want to come on and help tell us yeah. because you're going to get a lot of great feedback from this podcast and rightly so. Would you like to finish up on anything? Oh gosh, James. Um, I just say... I don't want people to ever stop believing in themselves. Yeah, it's important. Never stop believing yeah. in yourself. And you know when people say, if you can't say anything ni uh, nice, don't say anything at all. Mm -hmm. So that's actually really firm. So please think before you say anything to yourself or anyone else, because the power of the word and to this day, I remember the nasty things they called me. And that sort of, I remember that now. I don't let it affect it, affect me, but it did affect me. So the scars that you can't see stay with you forever, whereas the external heals. So just be kind because we, are, we don't have here a lifetime. We say lifetime is short lifetime. So it's not forever. Just my mom said, if you're gonna do anything in life, just remember people will not remember you with what how much you had, but rather how you made them feel. So I know that when I die, people are not gonna think of, oh, she had mm, this watch or these heels or this handbag or this house. They're gonna think, I remember her because um, how could she smile all the time or how did she make me feel? She always respects me because I, I know I can stand up. I'm being big headed now, but, you know, people might think I am, but I'm not. I, you will always see me very polite. I don't believe treating people badly. Yeah, that's a great thing to have, though. What's your social media and stuff for people to maybe get in contact and drop you a message and ask questions or maybe you, because I know you do the life coaching and stuff now as well. Maybe someone's wanting some help. Okay. absolutely yeah so my name i'm just going to hold this yeah, quickly so i think it's that camera because my name is spelled very differently so it's um l-u-r-a-t-a-l-y-o-n lurata lion but yeah. you can you know, people can say it how they wish so they've got every diff every different person re pronounces it differently so my full name in all social media even my website is just with the three w's dot lorettalion.com 
and they've got um, emails from my website doesn't seem to work very well so please do uh, either call me the number is there or text me or just social media very active on instagram but not very active on other things but i still pick up stuff loretta you absolute fucking legend listen <laughs> Proud of everything that you're doing, man, and it's unbelievable. I wish you nothing but the best for the future. You deserve everything great that comes into your life, and anything I can ever help with, you know I'm here. But God bless you, sending love, and I can't wait to see what you do for the future. Yeah, thank you so much, James.